My family owned many orchards. We grew cherries, apricots, prunes, peaches, and walnuts throughout the last century. This area was known to many as the Valley of the Heart's Delight. As I look through these trees just beginning their yearly cycle to bear fruit, I think of the beginnings of my family as fruit growers in this valley. My name is Marilyn Messina. Step right up, please. Step right up. Yes, next. Admittance is hereby granted to Stefano Messina. Welcome to the United States of America. My grandfather arrived in the Santa Clara Valley from Sicily around 1905. He and his bride Maria purchased their first land in northeast San Jose, a beautiful walnut and prune orchard where my father Richard, my aunts, and my uncle were all born. They called it the number one. But by the mid-1950s, our orchard had grown to 400 acres. The first orchards in the valley were planted here by the missionary fathers in the mid-1700s. They discovered a very rich and hardy topsoil. This is the soil that supported extraordinary fruit growing here in the Santa Clara Valley for a hundred years. In the 1800s, the Pallier brothers introduced from their native France what became known as the Pellier prune. This variety of prune was popularized, however, by John Quincy Adams Bellew. This created quite a boon to the fruit business. It came to dominate the entire fruit production here in the valley for close to 100 years. By the early 1900s, when my grandfather arrived here in the valley, despite the thriving fruit business that was emerging, he experienced many challenges, as did most of the immigrants who came here wishing to farm. He did not speak the language. He had to secure the land on which to plant trees. He had to purchase trees. He needed workers and equipment. This required financing. Many of the Italian immigrant growers readily received loans from Amadeo Giannini's Bank of Italy. My grandfather Stefano Messina died unexpectedly in 1946, leaving my dad with full responsibility for sustaining and running the business. My first experience of, of, that I recall of being in the orchard was when I was a very little girl. I always loved to be outside. So I'd go outside, wander outside. My mother was very busy at home and she would notice I was gone. And she would come out in the orchard calling me, calling me, trying to find me. And I could hear her, but I always wanted to keep going. I could see the end of the orchard. It was 50 acres away. By the late 1940s, our orchards consisted of several locations throughout the Berryessa area. Today, those orchards have become something very different. We are in northeast San Jose. We're on the border almost to Milpitas. This was the location of my grandparents' first orchard. This is where my father was born. My five aunts, who I love dearly, they were more like sisters and moms to me. And my Uncle Anthony. And when I came here as a little girl, there was a dirt road onto this property. And there was a huge mulberry tree that greeted you as soon as you, you pulled in. The orchard was pro approximately 100 acres. This was probably the most beautiful of all the orchards. This location was my father's peach orchard and he planted it himself. It was not inherited from my grandfather. It was pink, solid blossoms for about, oh, about three weeks. 
and people would come in buses to see these blossoms. Well, buying the land, planting the orchards, buying the orchards, that was just the beginning. The work had just begun. These are redbud, and the first blossoms are starting to appear, which was a lot like what my family was experiencing in the 1920s and 30s, when they were starting to feel the success of all their hard work. Here we are on my family's homestead on Capitol Avenue and Mayberry Road. We've been here a hundred years, 101 now. This was the location of our dry yard. The sulfur house was just off to my right. The platform, prune dipper, dehydrator, and large warehouse were closer to the road. The warehouse was just about where that tall pine tree is. And I think it was probably almost as tall or just as tall as that. And um, this was about 10 acres deep into just about the property line of the next family, the Buckland family. This is one of the four D4 Caterpillar tractors we had when the orchards were in full production. And I have countless memories of my father driving this tractor. I think it was one of his favorite things to do. He would actually be able to tilt it and turn it. It was always so fearful to see him do that, but he was an expert tractor driver. This is a 1941 orchard truck, and this truck hauled hundreds of cannery boxes to the canneries during the height of the fruit season. And when I was a little girl, my dad would sit here, our foreman Rafina would sit here, and I would sit here, driving to the orchards. My grandparents and family, now seven children, purchased this land from Floyd Lundy in 1922. This was called the Lundy Place. There was a beautiful Victorian just about where the front of this house is now. Unfortunately, it burned in 1931. And my grandparents worked continually up until about 1935 to earn money to construct this home, which was completed in 1935. But it was built in two stages. This is considered a outstanding example of Spanish Revival architecture. We are looking at knotted arched doorways, twisted columns with Corinthian capitals, and a very wide porch ending with gabled and wrought iron covered portholes. In 1915, the Panama, California Exposition in San Diego's Balboa Park featured exclusively Spanish Revival architecture. And here in San Jose, many of the immigrant communities really favored it because it was very reminiscent of their homelands. The home was built in two stages. The essential rooms here on the west side of the hall were the first phase. After several successful seasons, phase two of the house was completed, and you can see it was noticeably more elaborate. We have the twisted columns and the Corinthian capitals carried over from the outdoor capitals, and lighted sconces, we have a beautiful fireplace. Let's take a drive over to Los Altos to the History Museum. They have a fabulous agricultural display for what was going on in the big picture of the Valley of the Heart's Delight.
Dr. Ward, thank you so much for this time here and this beautiful display for ag history for Santa Clara Valley. And, you know, we know what was going on with the Messina Orchard. And, you know, we're doing quite a bit of, of information about that. But I'd like to hear, and I think the audience would like to hear, what was the bigger picture of the valley, of this extraordinary boom we had going on for Valley of the Heart's Delight? Uh, here at the Los Altos History Museum, we definitely believe that the past shapes the future. And so many people don't recognize the impact that the orchards and the different orchards around here continue to play today in the neighborhoods, the streets, the way they're laid out, the street names. There is just so much of decisions that were made in the past that impact our present and that teaches us the same thing happens. Decisions we make today are going to impact future generations. Um, we think it's so important that the next generation understand what was here before them, what their grandparents, great grandparents had gone through um, and to really take that memory and to share it forward. Noticing there's a California fruit exchange cannery box. This is um, indicative of the, the fruit exchange was an enormous organization of fruit growers in the valley. One of the things they did that was unique to other co-ops is they gave funding. They helped the farmers and, you know, establish themselves with yeah. actual financial assistance. It's also interesting how many companies got started in this area, like the Gerber company. They started out as a fruit growing company before they got into the baby food business. And um, we have an S&W crate here as well. Um, but the more famous one in this area is Del Monte, of course, right up the road here. And um, so there are just huge fruit packing and canning companies that were so important to getting these products that were grown here actually out to market. During the agricultural boom period of the Valley of Heart's Delight, the farmers and the orchardists were dealing with a lot of technical issues, they were dealing with a lot of business issues, and it really was uh, production to make all of this come together and getting their produce out to market took the trains and you had the the spray equipment to make sure that you didn't have bug infestation the sulfur sheds all this labor that went into it and then another key factor was the water uh, this chart shows especially here the blue the well water level so like when your grandfather first arrived the well water would have been would have only taken like five, 10 feet to start hitting water. But as the agricultural boom went on, they were going deeper and deeper, all the way down to lower than 40 feet, lower than 80 feet to try to hit water. By the 19, 1935, they're having to go down almost 120 feet to get to water. So it got harder and harder. Now it did rebound. You had some good years, it would start to rebound, but it still was much harder to get to water. And then by the 70s, it's just gotten, here you're going 160 feet down to try to get to water. So this water issue is one of the great ways we can connect the past to the present and to the future, because obviously water management was really important in the agricultural period, and it's still super important today. Thank you so much for coming here today to the Los Santos History Museum. Oh, it was wonderful. I couldn't have asked for a better day. Well, we've just got a few more weeks before the trees will be in full bloom. And can we only imagine what it was like to see 100,000 fruit trees in full bloom? Being out here in these rows of beautiful blossoming trees, I look down these rows and I expect my dad's truck to be, to be coming down the way to pick me up. There was a time the Messina Orchard was 400 acres, but now I have only have about five left. So here we are at Andy's Orchard in Morgan Hill, trying to get a glimpse of what thousands of trees look like in bloom. We farm about 70 acres here and it's all specialty varieties, intensive labor. We usually use uh, um, about 25 uh, permanent workers here. The family moved here in 1958. My family actually came from, uh, came from Europe in, in the 1930s and we settled in Cupertino and then now we're here in Morgan Hill. I 
always liked farming growing up on the farm. I tried out a different profession, but I ended up back here. I just like the visceral contact with the soil. There's a Chinese proverb that says, I farm the soil, I share creation, kings can't do no more. We specialize, we specialize in, in stone fruits and a lot of different varieties. We have upwards of like 300 different varieties that we grow. Now this here used to be a rundown cherry orchard and so we saved the best part and then we planted apricots here. So these are just two year old apricots. And um, uh, so these will be, these, uh, these will be, uh, see, I'm 77 years old and I'm still planting trees. The whole idea is I got to live until those things start to produce. Yeah. So it gives me some incentive to hang around. Yeah, there were, there were in the old days, there were more peaches grown here, but then they all kind of went to the Central Valley. See, we actually develop our own varieties too. This one here is called Tesoro, which means treasure in Spanish. It's uh, just, a one, just a one row. See, each row is different. Each row is different. That's the difference between, between what we're doing today and what, what, what they did in the past. I had to specialize. Each line here is a different variety and they come in at different times. And so we go to farmer's markets, we sell at the store, you've been to the yes. store. Each week you come in, you'll find different varieties because that's what we do. Esta es una variedad y le vamos a poner otra en, encima para eliminar esta. Entonces aquí, esta es la otra, la nueva variedad. Esa, la nueva variedad es um, Sandra Rose. Vamos a poner aquí sound. Y es, este es el proceso de corta uno el injerto aquí. Le corta uno aquí. Luego le, le abremos aquí poquito. Y le cortamos poquito aquí. Y lo, lo ponemos. Este en tres meses va a estar moviendo. One thing I, I don't remember growing up in our orchards is drip irrigation. We had two methods that I recall. One of them were the long ditches mm -hmm. that went all the way crisscrossing <laughs> the orchard. And they were filled with water. And I used to make little boats out of walnut shells and see how far my boats would, fly, would, would sail. Then that was replaced by the very large sprinkler heads. And those okay. sprinkler heads would shoot 40, 50 feet. Yeah. The newest technology now, uh, a micro sprinkler gives you enough water to make the tree healthy without wasting water. This is a peach blossom right here. And you know, it's it, a lot of people don't realize this, but it has male and female parts. And the, fem the male part has to, has, to, uh, has to get in contact with the female part in order to form a seed. The fruit forms around the seed. The stigma is right in the middle. That's part of the female part of the flower. And then the anthers, which are the male part of the flower, are around there. And they're the ones that throw out the pollen and land on the stigma. That accomplishes pollination. And then later on, the pollen tube will, will grow down the, the style, which is the, part, the female part of the flower, and, and fertilize the, the egg, which becomes the seed. The fruit develops around the seed. When you have a lot of rain, if you have a lot of cold, you don't have a lot of insect um, uh, activity, you're not going to have that happen, and then you don't, you don't get a fruit. So that's, that's basically it. Um, um, there are different kinds of flowers. This uh, peaches in general are self-fertile. That means the pollen only has to fall from one part of the flower to the other. With cherries, they're self-sterile. In other words, you have to get pollen from one kind of variety and physically has to travel to another tree of another kind of variety to do the pollination. Now, how do we do that? We use bees. We don't need bees and peaches and, ne and nectarines and, and also apricots, but you do need bees and cherries. Here we are back at the Messina Orchard with my beekeeper, Doug Smith who has been our beekeeper here for many years and knows everything there is to know about bees. So, it's all yours, Doug. Bees are definitely an in integral part of, of human survival and, and, and just existence. Um, they serve a purpose of pollinating, but they also produce honey. Um, my relation with bees, I, I just 
I can learn so much from them. Without bees, you know, it's, it's said that one out of four forkfuls of food at your table comes as a result of the bees. There's a lot of people who've got a one or two fruit trees in their backyard that these bees will fly up two or three miles. When this orchard's in bloom, they're moving, working, working the flowers, getting nutrition. I'm providing the bees needs. First of all, they need a space that's sort of dry and you know, out of the wind and out of the water. Places for them to store the honey as well as raise the young bees, the brood. I also need to treat for mites, which are a parasite that has caused a lot of trouble with the bees. And keep an eye on just if they need water, you know, provide water somewhere out in the yard for them. Sometimes I need to replace a queen because a queen, a new queen failed or something like that. And, and they take care of most of everything else themselves. In the this process right now, I'm looking at the frames, but I'm, I'm trying to find a queen, at least signs of the queen. Um, one of the ways that I can, if I don't physically see the queen, is to find larva that's uncapped. There's some uncapped larva here, but really with this particular setup, I want to see some eggs. And I haven't seen eggs yet, but then I wouldn't expect to at this point. But um, I'll come, oh, there's a queen. I got a queen, a big fat, plump queen. Here she goes. She's depositing an egg right now. She found an open cell. And so the, the queen's pheromones are very essential for the stability of the hive. The, the bees, they, they say that if a queen is removed from a hive within 15 minutes, the whole colony knows that she's gone. Bees are the most efficient source of pollination. This is what God created them for. There are countries who have to pollinate by hand, but they struggle. It's very labor intensive and it's not as efficient as bees. And there's tens of thousands of different insects out there that are doing all sorts of pollinating like the bees are. It's just the bees are, tend to be a little more efficient and uh, they produce honey on, on top of all that. Throughout you know, the, the, the spring into the fall and the winter time, you know, we could easily have four or five generations of bees in, in that hive. You know, they're, they're all sisters, um, the, the worker bees that is, or their brothers the drones you know, from a single queen. Do your best. If you see bees, don't kill them. Call, call a beekeeper, you know. There's a lot of places you can reach out and find people who will rescue these bees. We need the bees. They are not vicious and typically they won't disturb you or bother you. They just want to do their thing. Well, I see a lot of cherries emerging from these beautiful white blossoms, much like we saw at Andy's Orchard. And for both of us, a lot can happen and will happen before these are harvested and ready for anyone's dinner table. We're at harvest time now, and there's lots of different fruits to be harvested. And back in the days of the operation of the orchards, we'd be putting out boxes and buckets. These ladders, I, I remember countless men, not too many women climbed to the top of the 16-foot ladder. There were hundreds of pounds of fruit that was carried up and down these ladders. And um, getting ready for all of the pickers that will start the first day of the week and keep on through until, until they finished at least the first picking. Everybody was anticipating the harvest and also the beautiful cooking and pastries and canning and jams and breads and everything that my you know my grandmother and my aunts would make and the ladies were becoming very anxious about cutting apricots and packing cherries that was something here in the area that we did in our warehouse because it was big enough Most of the growers had a very good relationship with the canneries. There was close to 150 or possibly more canneries here in the valley at that time. The buyers would come out to the orchard with metal rings and they would measure the fruit to determine if it was number ones, twos, or threes. And of course everyone wanted number ones because that was the highest price. In case there was a delay and your pickers did not show up or you only had 
half the crews show up. Then there was a delay at the canneries. If the canneries were flooded with a lot of fruit from all the other growers and you were late, they may not take it. harvest was especially fun for me. We had a very large warehouse and it was two-story and when the prunes were uh, cleaned, dried, and dehydrated, they would shake out onto trays where little small elevator buckets would pick them up and take them and dump them into the warehouse. And after a week or so, there was mountains of dried prunes in that warehouse. And that, those mountains would go all the way to the top of the very tall window. There was one window that was way up at the top of that warehouse. And I climbed those prunes. I wasn't supposed to, but I climbed those mountains of prunes always to get to see up that top window. And I could actually see all the way to downtown San Jose. The fragrance of the dried prunes was wonderful. Well, I've, you know, I've told about the, my memories of the past and what our harvest was like, but I know that presently we have growers that are picking right now. I know Charlie Olson is picking his cherry crop, so maybe we can go take a look. Charlie, I, w I want to thank you for having us here today. And, um, you know, you cannot talk about cherries in the Santa Clara Valley without talking about the Olsons. I'm Charlie Olson, and I'm the third generation uh, of, the, of the Olson family. And uh, I was taught to save my money, be frugal, and that's how I lived. The story was they came here in 1899. They had a famine in Sweden, and uh, the king of Sweden offered anybody free one-way ticket by boat to New York City. They said, go out west. So he got on the train and as far as he could go was San Francisco. So he bought five acres of land downtown Sunnyville where the Target store is right now. So I kept it going because I liked it and I had a wonderful crew my father and mother had developed on the ranch. Uh, there was about seven or 8,000 farm families in the valley and they produced uh, you know, millions of cans of fruit a year. So we're picking cherries right now. So this year it's a small crop, so we have a small group. So a lot of the people come back year after year. I knew at an early age the value of these people. And they loved my parents, and so I learned to be the same way my parents were. Well, we had many, many workers. Uh, some of them stayed their entire life. Our two foremen, Rufino and Martin Aguilera, started with my grandfather as a young man. They were all young together, and they continued on for 55 years. Okay. Yo me llamo Armando Ballín. Yo soy de México, de Guadalajara, Jalisco, México. Y ahora ando piscando cherries. Yo tengo aquí trabajando aquí con el Mr. Olson como 33 años. Mi padre trabajó como 44 años. Oh, sí, yo tengo mi familia aquí. Yo vivo aquí en San José. Tengo, tengo tres hijos y dos hijas. Aquí está trabajando uno por horas. Pero de todo, de, de, de todo Mr. Olson paga muy bien. Si el árbol tiene mucha fruta, puede, y si el árbol está medio grande, puede hacer uh, dos árboles en un día. La cherry tiene que venir con este cabo de aquí, para que dure un tiempecito más. Oh, I love this work because it gives me a feeling of purpose. Uh, what would I do to get up in the morning? What would, where would I go? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, this, is, this is waiting for me to take care of it. Being part of the harvesting today and watching the fruit being picked and 
and sorted and loaded onto the trucks is what it must have felt like for my grandparents and my dad and my aunts when they first experienced those years of success and reaping great harvests from the orchards they had worked so hard during the Depression to plant and nurture. And we are also getting close now to that dinner table ready. I'm so happy to be here today with Lisa Prince Newman, who is a author of a fabulous book called For Love of Apricots, and we're certainly in the right place for it. So this is the home I grew up in, but the mm -hmm. home my dad built mm -hmm. when he married, and that's my grandmother's house, and this was the connecting path between those two homes. And you know, I wish I had a picture to show you, but I don't. But in the kitchen, there's the 1934 cover of Sunset Magazine that just depicts her beautifully. It was an unusual and unique privilege to be so close to my grandmother and my aunts, too, because they would come all the time. This is a cookbook that, you know, runs from uh, breakfast to cocktails, but included our appetizers. And one thing that's important to me about, you know, the apricot orchard and, and harvest and, and the heritage that we grew up with, you know, of, of using that fruit in many, many different forms. And one of the most important forms, after you've been gushed on your fresh apricots in the summer and baked your pies, is dried apricots. And the generous California sunshine allows us to preserve so much of the harvest because it's so um, perishable, right? F ripe fruit is so perishable. You know that from your experience. It certainly is. In 24 hours you can have a lot of spoilage just in that short of time. Isn't it true? I heard one farmer here in the valley say, you know, green yesterday, ripe today, and rotten tomorrow. That's right. right. So the beauty of the heritage techniques is to lay out trays of cut apricots in the sunshine mm -hmm. and, and preserve them for use throughout the year. So that's what this uh, recipe showcases. And it just takes advantage of very simple ingredients, but with all simple recipes, it's the quality of the ingredients that matters. So what we're doing is we're making bacon-wrapped apricots. And it's a fantastic, simple appetizer. So we're going to make a California upside down cake and um, you know upside down cakes are a true bit of Americana and this time we're going to be using apricots and a really rich delicious batter that includes almond paste. There's just such an affinity between almonds and apricots and so we're taking advantage of that and the other thing that is marvelous with apricots and a real flavor enhancer is um, oranges. So we're going to be, we have some grated orange peel that we're going to put into the mix as well. So, but of course, the first thing we got to do is get the pits out of those cots. <laughs> what was that like growing up on an orchard, doing oh, that regularly? It was fun. <laughs> Cutting apricots was one of the highlights of the summer because a lot of the ladies would bring their kids with them and we would play with them. So we always had built-in playmates in the summer. Here we go, into the oven. It's gonna cook for about 40 minutes. Well, here's the moment we've been waiting for, our California upside down cake with fresh apricots from the season. It came out of the oven, I think it looks good. It's sort of like having my family here. These trees have been here, many of them as long as I have, some longer. 
and knowing that they're trees that were planted and nurtured by my grandfather and my father, they're like old friends. Long gray filly and the big black horse, do -da, do -da. We had people in the orchard during the harvest season every day. And the pickers, and sometimes uh, the family too, because my cousins would all come over. And uh, we would sit in a circle like this. And there was always a guitar. It's the migrant workers and the hourly workers. Somebody always had a guitar. Then everybody would go back to work in an hour or so. And uh, it was one of the, those are some of the best memories of my life. <laughs> When my dad would come in in the morning, he'd say, this is your breakfast, soft apricot. So I would come outside and it would be dripping down my chin. I said, this is the best thing ever, Daddy. <laughs> and I was probably six years old. I had a special little tree with a special little ladder and a special little bucket that I would always go to and and fill my little bucket up about six in the morning when, when uh, fruit season came. Well, I remember the first time I bit into an apple and the juice hit my eye. <laughs> Walnut trees make great tree forts. When I was a kid, we would make a tree fort in those walnut trees or something else. Cherry pies I made with my grandmother, hands down. I love those cherry pies too. They were my favorite when I was a little girl. That and peaches. When I moved to California and was living with my aunt and uncle, they had uh, plum trees and apricot trees. And my aunt and I would pick the plums and the apricots and it was the first time I'd ever canned. Some of the kids would come back summer after summer because the migrant families liked picking here in the valley. You know, the, the pay was very good here because the area was so successful. So they would come year after year and we all got a little older every year. And I can't remember their names, but I'll, their faces I'll never forget. What we're working on here is a 1941 Chevy one-ton truck, 216 cubic inches of thrust. It will start off a button off the floor, and here it goes. Come on, baby, start up. Ready to go to work once again. I was a little girl that loved to ride my bike. I rode my bike every day from beginning to end. And I went all over the neighborhood. And I would follow my dad's truck down to the other orchards, which were off the Sierra Road. It was a dirt road that separated the two big orchards. And I could see him ahead of me. I couldn't catch up, but I could see the dust. I just remember riding that little bike down Hoover Lane and knowing my dad was at the end when I'd get there. Over a period of a couple of decades, and that's all it took, um, it transformed from, from the, the old Santa Clara Valley we knew, the Valley of Hearts Delight, to Silicon Valley. And it started out with a, a few high-tech firms, then the farmers actually started selling out. They were developing into industrial parks, uh, housing developments, strip malls. 